Okay, welcome to everybody to this uh, second uh, talk uh, within the uh, Giornata Indam 2021. I am Claudio Canuto and uh, I will uh, chair uh, the, this uh, second presentation. Uh, we are very pleased and honored to have here today Christian Lubich, who is uh, one of the greatest name of uh, contemporary mathematics uh, numeri and numerical analysis. Uh, Christian received his uh, PhD in, uh, um, in 1983 from his uh, hometown uh, University of Innsbruck uh, under the supervision of uh, Ernest Eirer with a thesis on uh, numerical solution of uh, uh, Volterra equations. Then after spending uh, some years at the universities of Innsbruck, Geneva, at the ETH in Zurich and at Würzburg, in uh, 1994 became professor at the University of Tübingen, where he is, uh, he is now. The, uh, the spectrum of scientific interest of Christian is incredibly broad the light motif uh, being uh, uh, evolutionary uh, phenomena. But not only the, 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 the spectrum of interest is broad, but also the, the spectrum of fundamental uh, contributions, fundamental results uh, he has given in uh, every uh, topic uh, he, has, uh, he has visited. Christian is uh, uh, worldwide known for his studies on uh, uh, geometric and num uh, numerical integration in, in uh, structure preserving uh, numerical methods uh, for ordinary uh, differential equations. And in this field, uh, he has a, a long lasting uh, uh, collaboration with uh, Ernst Eirer, which in particular led to a celebrated uh, book on uh, uh, geometric uh, numerical integration. Another relevant uh, interest concerns the study of numerical methods uh, for uh, uh, quantum physics, in particular uh, quantum dynamics. And here again produced uh, a book uh, on, from quantum to classical molecular dynamics, uh, reduced uh, models and numerical analysis with the European Mathematical Society. Among the Many other research fields. Uh, let me mention uh, time discretization uh, methods for evolutionary partial differential equations and integral equations, dynamical uh, uh, low rank approximations of matrices and tensors, numerical methods uh, for uh, evolving surfaces, which uh, I think is uh, uh, is the topic of uh, of today's talk. Uh, Christian has produced uh, over 160 uh, publications uh, to date and uh, uh, for his uh, outstanding contributions uh, has received various prestigious awards and honors. In particular, he was the recipient of the Siam Dahlquist Prize in uh, 2001. And in 2018, he was a plenary speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Rio de Janeiro with a talk uh, with a beautiful title, uh, Dynamics, uh, Numerical Analysis, and uh, some, uh, some Geometry, very interdisciplinary contributions. Finally, uh, let me just mention that Christian is a very good uh, friend of the Italian uh, mathematical community. He has uh, ongoing uh, collaborations uh, with uh, several Italian research groups in particular, with uh, Nicola Guglielmi at uh, GSSI. He uh, hosted uh, Italian students uh, in, in Tübingen, and uh, he has been a teacher uh, at the SMI uh, uh, summer school in Perugia for uh, remarkably five, uh, five years. And uh, he speaks also Italian. Uh, but I think today he will, uh, he will use the general language of uh, science. So, uh, it's again a pleasure to have uh, you here, Christian, and uh, I let the scene to you. Uh, thank you, Claudio, for this uh, very kind introduction. I feel really honored and uh, I really appreciate it 
this invitation to the Indum to speak at the Indum Day, uh, particularly because of my longstanding uh, connections to Italian mathematics that Claudia just mentioned. So uh, I think uh, I think it was just four times that they gave this uh, numerical analysis course in in Perugia, but. Uh, I really enjoyed these summer months there. Uh, I have a long-standing collaboration with Nicola Guglielmi at the Grand Sasso Science Institute in L'Aquila. And uh, just uh, a month ago, uh, my Italian PhD student Gianluca Ceruti finished his uh, thesis, uh, PhD thesis in, in, in Tübingen. So you see there, these are just some connections, but there are more connections to Italian mathematics, uh, which I really enjoy. And uh, I was also very much looking forward to meeting my Italian colleagues here at this Indian day. Unfortunately, this didn't work out in the last moment. And since this became an online event, only uh, uh, really at the last moment, uh, I got an email about that uh, last Friday, uh, I didn't cancel my visit to Italy. And so actually I'm speaking to you from a hotel room uh, in, in Rome uh, with my seven year old son in the background if you see someone moving around. So but now let me come to mathematics. I want to talk to you about the numerical treatment, uh, numerical analysis of uh, geometric evolution equations. And for that, before I begin with the talk proper, let me just give you a video uh, that somehow gives you a, uh, gives an appetizer for what I'm about to do. So I hope you see these two balls. Uh, actually, that should start here from a, a ball like this. Uh, can you, can you see? We don't see the balls. You don't see the balls. I mean, I don't okay. see it. Uh, just, it worked previously. Huh. Okay, something is coming. Do you see me? Okay. Do, do you see them? Do you see them now? Now, yes. So there are two, uh, there's a ball. So that's the initial datum uh, for a tumor growth model. Uh, and just look at the left-hand uh, picture. There you see different codings. This corresponds to the concentration of some substance that is reacting and diffusing on the surface. But at the same time, it interacts with the shape of the surface. So as time evolves, there's a reaction diffusion pattern going on, but there's also the movement of the surface. And this is a model that has been proposed for tumor growth. And of course, this gives nice, uh, nice pictures, but what is the model behind? What do we actually compute? And can we say anything about the reliability of such computations? Is there some justification that if I do, if I choose the mesh sufficiently fine, that will converge to a correct solution? This is somehow the topic of my talk. And now let me come to the talk proper. So I hope this can be seen. Yes, good. So I want to talk about numeric methods for geometric evolution equations and a particular class of such methods, which are known as evolving surface finite element methods. And they, such methods have been around, but it's fairly recent that uh, convergence results have been obtained about that. So I will take and <clears throat> we'll talk about convergent evolving surface finite element algorithms uh, such algorithms that are provably convergent for various uh, geometric evolution equations. And what I talk today is joint work with Balash Kovash, who was a, 
uh, postdoc with me at Tübingen and is now at the University of Regensburg in Germany. And with Bu Yang Li, uh, who was a Humboldt fellow uh, at Tübingen and is now an associate professor at the Polytechnic University of Hong Kong. Here's the outline. Well, there are introductory parts. Then I will mainly concentrate on the approximation of mean curvature flow. Tell you about its discretization and the convergent results we have obtained and end with numerical experiments. And so let me begin with an introduction, very short introduction to geometric evolution equations. And let me begin with mean curvature flow. Uh, suppose you have a, a, a closed surface, closed two-dimensional surface in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. And mean curvature flow determines the velocity of a point on the surface as being well, uh, as the, the normal component of this velocity, the tangential component uh, doesn't change, uh, doesn't change the surface, but the normal component of the velocity is supposed to be uh, the negative mean, uh, mean curvature. So the normal ve velocity, which is always denoted by capital V in my talk, is Put e is set equal to minus the mean curvature, which is the sum of the two principal curvatures. And this is somewhat of a prime example of geometric evolution equations. Uh, in his review, uh, White uh, writes, uh, there are many processes by which a curve or surface can evolve, but among them, one is arguably the most natural, the mean curvature flow. Uh, and there has been a lot of uh, analysis uh, done on uh, this, uh, this problem. And let me, among the things that are known that if you start from an initial convex surface, then it will shrink to a point and asymptotically, it will take the form, uh, the shape of a, 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 of a ball, but then reduces the radius more and more. On the other hand, when the initial surface is not convex, but say something like a dumbbell, then you, you run into uh, something like uh, a pinch singularity uh, in finite time. And here I give you such a dumbbell example where at a certain time it gets thinner and thinner from a certain time onwards, it gets thinner and thinner here, at least at this bottleneck and then runs into a, a singularity. Now I will tell you about convergent methods, but I should say in advance, we're not able yet uh, to treat the behavior of uh, the numerical method near such a pinch singularity. So essentially what I will tell you about is the evolution and the approximation of, uh, of the evolution up to a point, uh, up to the leftmost point where the solution still is uh, very regular, where we have a smooth solution, a smooth surface. Nevertheless, it's interesting to see that our algorithm is actually more intelligent than we are improving its properties. Uh, it behaves very well, also into the singularity. Now, mean curvature flow is just one example. I began with this video on this tumor growth model. And this is actually built up of mean curvature flow plus some forcing terms. And these uh, uh, forcing terms are linear, linear combination of the components of a system of reaction diffusions on the evolving surface. So you not only have the evolving surface, but you also have a reaction diffusion going on on the uh, surface, which interacts with the evolution of the surface. Uh, and this is this example of tumor growth that I began showed you in the video. So we have a form like this. Then there are various generalizations uh, of mean curvature flow, which are 
of interest in very diverse applications. Uh, there's this generalized mean curvature flow, which takes a pointwise function of the mean curvature, say some fractional power of the mean curvature. And in particular, if they take alpha equal minus one, you have the inverse mean curvature flow, which plays a prominent role in uh, the study of general relativity. And other very fascinating uh, geometric uh, evolution equation is the Wilma flow, which is the L2 gradient flow for the bending energy. And this elastic bending energy is uh, the integral over the surface of uh, the square of uh, the mean curvature. Uh, and it, it's known that uh, the normal velocity then takes a, a form which involves the Laplacian, the surface Laplacian of the mean curvature. So this gives a fourth order uh, evolution equation because mean curvature, well, curvature involves two space derivatives, and then you have the Laplacian. So this gives a fourth order uh, evolution equation. And then there's some extra term which involves the mean curvature and also the Gaussian curvature. And this is a prominent model for biomembranes and uh, similar objects. And just let me give you some evolution from different initial values. So the first line gives three different initial value from something like an ellipsoid, a shape that looks like a red blood cell and some deformed torus. And uh, the ellipsoid turns over long times into a ball. So, but the ball keeps uh, the, a constant radius. This is different from mean curvature flow, which also evolves into a ball, but the radius uh, shrinks so that the, that the surface shrinks to a point, whereas here it, it keeps uh, uh, a fixed uh, radius asymptotically. It also evolves into such uh, uh, a sphere uh, in the case of the second initial datum, which looks like a red blood cell. And in the case of a torus, it turns into a, a proper torus with a particular ratio uh, of the two radii. Uh, it's known as a Clifford torus. And what's shown below is that the elastic energy uh, or Wilma energy as it's called. So this converges to stationary point in each of these cases. And there famous conjecture, have been famous conjectures, the Wilma conjecture about uh, the minimality of this torus, which has been uh, resolved uh, about five years ago. So this is also an, uh, a flow that has been studied very much in geometric analysis. Uh, quite closely related to this Wilma flow is surface diffusion flow, which also has the Laplacian of mean curvature, but no extra terms. And this has been used as a model for crystal growth and uh, similar phenomena. So this was just to give you some examples. And now let me give you a summary of my talk. So we want to approximate surface flows such as the ones that I just showed you. And the kind of methods that we use is finite element methods. Finite elements, they are built up from a finite number of nodal points. And these nodal points move in time and they determine the surface. So the moving surface is determined by the nodes of a finite element mesh that moves in time. And then the question is, of course, how do you move these nodes? And the approach that we have found to work very well is to discretize just the velocity equation. So the velocity of such a node is given by the normal velocity, which is given by the velocity law, and multiply it with a normal vector. So in this case, we just have a normal uh, 
uh, normally uh, an evolution going normal to the surface. We could add, add uh, tangential uh, components to improve the mesh quality, but this will not be a topic of the talk today. So we have this velocity equation, but then this alone is not enough. We must somehow add extra or, or auxiliary geometric quantities and evolve them. And what our pro, in our approach, we choose some auxiliary geometric quantities, which in the examples that I showed you are just mean curvature and the no, outer normal vector, and use parabolic evolution equations for them under the surface flow. And by combining this system, uh, we get a discrete system which we can analyze. And we obtain a provably convergent numerical method, which yields optimal order error bounds in the H1 Sobolev norm on bounded time intervals, as long as the exact surface is uh, smooth. So we cannot study the behavior near such a pinch singularity that I showed you, but as long as the surface is smooth, uh, we have a provably convergent method. We first did this for the mean curvature flow, pure mean curvature flow. Then uh, did it for the forced mean curvature flow, including this tumor growth example. Uh, there's uh, a preprint on Wilmer flow and surface diffusion flow. And uh, Balas Kovac, uh, my collaborator on these first three papers, had re has recent work uh, with uh, former PhD student in Tübingen, Tim Bintz, on generalized mean curvature flow, including the inverse mean curvature flow, and also mean curvature flow in higher co-dimensions. And we have plans on treating Gaussian curvature flow uh, all by essentially the same uh, basic approach of using the velocity equation and appropriate evolution equations for auxiliary geometric quantities. And I want to explain with this approach. That's the purpose of my, of my talk. To do this, I need some no basic notations, uh, basic notions from differential geometry and some notation. I'll go through this rather quickly. What we want to evolve is a closed surface. And we consider the evolving surface, surface as being parametrized by the initial surface. And the flow map x of p and t describes, well, now let me describe it in physical rather dif than dif uh, differential geometric terms. So think of P as a particle on the initial surface and this particle is moving in time. And then X of P and T would be uh, the position of such a moving uh, particle at time T. And the evolving surface is composed of all these particles at a given time. This physical description corresponds very well to the numerical discretization that they will then propose. On the other hand, uh, it's from the differential geometric viewpoint, it's more uh, common to view this as a parametrization over the initial surface. But I want to emphasize that we never actually work with a parametrization, an explicit parametrization of our flow map. And just for the notation, gamma of t is now this evolving surface. And to indicate the dependence on this flow map, I, I'll write it as gamma of x or uh, of t, or if t is uh, clear from the context, I just write gamma of x. So this is the object that I want to approximate, gamma of t. For this, I need the velocity, which is just the time derivative of the flow map. The velocity at any point on the surface at time t is the time derivative of the flow map at time t at 
the point which corresponds to this uh, uh, particle which takes the location x uh, at time t. And then there's the material derivative, which indicates how quantities change along the motion of a particle. So it's the time derivative of u along this uh, flow map at time t. So these are basic concepts. Then I need some other basic concepts, basic notions from differential geometry. The tangential gradient of the surface now of some function u. Now, if u were, uh, were uh, defined in the neighborhood uh, uh, of the surface in the ambient space, then this would be just the, uh, the projection to the tangent plane uh, of the usual three-dimensional uh, uh, gradient. Then you also have a surface divergence and built from the, sur the, the surface divergence of a vector field. And if you combine the two, you get the Laplace Beltrami operator, which is basic uh, here. And all, all these are well-known differential geometric uh, notions. If you're not familiar with uh, these differential geometric notions, they behave in many ways uh, similar to the usual uh, gradient uh, divergence and Laplace operator of functions on R3. Then if I have a closed surface with an interior and an exterior, I can define the autonormal uh, vector field, which at every point of the surface associates the autonormal vector uh, to this point. There's the Weingarten map or second fundamental form, which is determined from the tangential gradient of the normal vector field. So curvature, Weingarten maps determines the curvature and curvature uh, indicates how the normal vector changes. So it's the gradient of the normal vector, which comes here. This is actually a three by three symmetric matrix. It has three eigenvalues. One is zero because the normal vector is always in the null space of this matrix A of X. And the other two eigenvectors are uh, the principal curvatures kappa one and kappa two. I can form the sum of the squares of these principal curvatures, which is equal to the squared Frobenius norm of this matrix. And I denote it by uh, absolute value of A squared, or Frobenius norm of A squared. And now come to mean curvature, which is just the trace of the Weingarten map or the sum of the principal curvatures. And now with these uh, notions, uh, we can turn to mean curvature flow. Here it is in all its beauty. The normal velocity equals to the negative mean curvature. Now, this is very compact, but how do you approximate such an evolution? And one of the first methods, and actually the first finite element method, was uh, proposed by Juk uh, more than 30 years ago, who pr proposed an evolving surface finite element method and lets the approximate surface be determined by the moving nodes of a finite element mesh. And we will do actually the same. But what we will do differently from Juk is that Juk uses a weak formulation of mean curvature flow, which is very elegant because this, in this weak formulation, mean curvature flow looks formally similar to the heat equation. But I would like to emphasize, emphasize that this is a formal similarity because the heat equation is a parabolic equation, whereas the equation that we'll count on the next slide looks like the heat equation, but is not fully parabolic. And due to this lack of parabolicity, uh, up to date, there is no convergent result for the method that uh, Juke proposed. 
at least not for closed two-dimensional surfaces. Well, for the analogous problem for curves, closed curves, uh, there's a conversion result by Juk himself just a few years later who, who proves the convergence for his evolving finite element methods for curves, but it has remained an open problem whether his method converges for closed surfaces. There's a convergent result for, surf for, open sur for surfaces with a boundary that are graphs, uh, again by Juk together with Dektinik, uh, but not for uh, closed surfaces. However, I would like to mention that there's a, a recent preprint by Huyang Li, who is one of the co-authors of uh, the papers that I mentioned earlier on which this talk is based. Uh, he wrote a pre, uh, published a, put a, the, he had a preprint this year where he was able to show convergence of Juke's method uh, for closed two-dimensional surfaces. However, with the severe restrictions that his finite elements had to degree at least polynomial degree six, which makes it an unpractical method uh, for for actual computations. But it's a fascinating uh, result that Guiyang uh, obtained uh, uh, on this method. It's, it's, it's the first convergent result for Juke's method or a, uh, a variant of Juke's method uh, for, for closed two-dimensional surfaces. Now let me explain better what Juke actually did. So mean curvature flow sets the velocity of the surface equal to minus the mean curvature times the normal vector. And this vector on the right hand side, also called the mean curvature vector, uh, can be written as the Laplacian of the identity map on uh, the surface. So I denote by x gamma the identity map on my surface. And then the material derivative of this identity map equals the Laplacian on the surface. So formally, this looks like the heat equation. And there's very, well, if basically all is known uh, what one wants uh, about the numerical approximation of the heat equation. But although it looks formally like the heat equation, this is not a parabolic equation because gamma itself depends on the position. And this equation uh, is really more painful th than it looks. And this led to this difficulties in, in the convergence analysis. So based on this heat formulation as a heat-like equation, Druk just used the weak formulation as is usual for finite element methods. So he multiplies with test functions on both sides, does partial integration and ends up with this weak formulation and uses this formulation for the velocity together with the differential equation for the positions. Uh, so the time derivative uh, of our flow map equals the velocity evaluated at the flow map. And this is the approach uh, taken by Druk. He discretizes these two equations. This is very elegant, but as I told you, there's no convergence result to date, uh, at least for finite elements, say of order, well, if not order one, say order two or order three or something, uh, but order six is, is quite exotic from a numerical uh, scientific computing uh, viewpoint. Now, the approach that we take here is a different one. We leave this evolution, this velocity equation unchanged. So the velocity is minus the mean curvature times the normal vector. And we really dis will discretize this equation uh, quite simply by interpolation on the finite element mesh. But we add extra normal, extra geometric quantities for which we use evolution equations. And in particular, we use evolution equations for the normal vector and for mean curvature flows, which are not new, 
that have been derived by Husken, who is one of the great experts uh, on mean curvature flow in his very first paper on mean curvature flow, who used these evolution equations for the analysis of mean curvature flow. So such evolution equations for auxiliary uh, geometric quantities, they are fundamentally the analysis of mean curvature flow, but somewhat surprisingly, they, until recently, they were not used for numerics. But that's exactly what we will do here. So we formulate this, we find, we find and use evolution equations which are of parabolic type uh, for suitable geometric quantities. And in our case, this turns out to be the normal vector and the mean curvature and add this to this equation above. And then we still have the equation for the positions, namely the time derivative of the flow map, uh, flow map for the positions equals the velocity. And that's what we do. So we have this, equation for the positions we have the velocity equation and we add these evolution equations for the normal vector and mean curvature flow in weak form and these are the equations that we ultimately discretize you see here i need to full a full and i need to fill a full, full slide with these equations so it's not as elegant as it was for proofs method who had this really elegant uh, heat-like equations. But on the other hand, this approach leads to a provably convergent algorithm. And this is what I want to explain you next. So I will discretize the equations that I just showed you, and I will show you or indicate to you uh, how, this is, how this is done. Now I start by putting a tri by triangulating the initial surface. So I put the mesh on the initial surface, a finite element mesh, and this has some nodes. And these nodes are then evolved in time. And they collect these nodes in a nodal vector denoted here by boldface, boldface x of t. Uh, so if I have n nodal points, then this is a vector large vector in uh, r to 3 to power n or in r to 3n. And then I interpolate these points and this defines an approximate surface denoted here by gamma h, where h as usual is the mesh width uh, of my uh, triangulation. And then I define nodal basis functions as is usual for finite element methods. At each node, I construct a, a piecewise polynomial function that takes the value one at one node and the zero at the others. And then these functions form span uh, a space, the finite element space with which, in which we look for an approximation. And this gives me the finite element space on this discrete surface, which is then actually the parametrization of a discrete surface spanned by these finite elements. And now, after these preparations, I can uh, come to the evolving surface finite element method. Uh, I have the discretized position equation and velocity equation, velocity equation just by interpolation of the velocity law. And I have the discretized evolution equations coming from the weak formulations uh, for the uh, equation for the normal vector and the mean curvature ve vector. And in this case, I obtain approximations to the position, the velocity, the normal vector, and the mean curvature uh, by finite element functions. But I would like to emphasize that the normal vector that I obtain through this evolution, 
and the mean curvature that they obtain through this evolution are not the normal vector of the discrete of the approximate surface and are not the mean curvature of the approximate surface, but they are approximations to them. Now I can formulate the equations more compactly in a matrix vector formulations for the nodal vector, the velocity vector, and then this involves the usual stiffness, mass and stiffness matrices, which now depend on the positions. And they obtain a system like this, which is less compact, but computationally similar to Juke's method, uh, which would just take the position equation here, equation for the velocity, and have this equation. Unfortunately for this, I cannot uh, prove convergence. For this, I can. And to get a full discretization, I still need to discretize these ordinary differential equations that I have obtained here in time. And for this, I use a linearly implicit backward difference, full discretization, which I will not describe you in detail, but essentially you, you replace the time derivatives by backward difference quotients. And uh, from one time step to, to the next, you extrapolate the uh, position values uh, to the next, and then this gives you a linearly implicit scheme. And for this fully discrete scheme, we are then able to prove convergence of optimal order. And this is the convergence result that we obtain. So we assume a sufficiently regular solutions, a sufficiently regular solution. I assume a quasi-uniform shape regular initial uh, triangulation. For the finite element, I need to assume that polynomial degree is at least two. So we do not yet have a proof of uh, linear finite elements of polynomial degree one. And I must evidently assume that the mesh size be sufficiently small, as we must do in every nonlinear evolution problem. And we also need a mild step size restriction between the time step tau and the spatial mesh size h with a constant which in principle is arbitrary, but which affects then the constants in the error bounds and also what it means that h be sufficiently small. And I need sufficiently accurate starting values. And under all these rather harmless uh, assumptions, uh, we can prove optimal order error bounds in the H1 norm, not only for the position, but also for the velocity, the normal vector, and the mean curvature. I would like to indicate you briefly some basic ingredients of the proof. Uh, it's not just one surface with which we have to work in the convergent analysis, but three. Uh, there's, of course, the exact surface here shown in gray. There's the discrete surface with which we actually compute. But we need this to compute this discrete surface to another finite element surface, namely the interpolated exact surface. And we need intermediate surfaces that, that link the discrete surface with the interpolated surface, which would be this surface gamma h theta, where theta would be between zero and one, which links these two. And then it's essential to control the errors in all our geometric quantities in the W1 infinity norm. So the L infinity norm for uh, the, these quantities and their spatial derivatives. And to do this, this is where uh, the requirement comes in that we have uh, polynomials of at least T degree two, because we, we can then use finite element inverse estimates, which is not possible. Hello. Persa la connessione. I think we have lost connection.
I think I lost the connection, uh, so I'll restart. Yes, the now, now we are you are again. Yes. Uh, is the screen still still shared? Uh, it, I think it's coming. Not yet, but uh, no, but I'll. You mean? Wait. Uh, is, is it here? I, do you see it? Yeah, we saw the, the I think the previous one with the uh, num remark you number. That yes. one? Yes, that, okay. was, uh, that was okay. Okay, so, so then I want to, uh, to speak about the separation to consistency errors and stability. So consistency errors are obtained if you take the exact solution, the exact surface, project it onto the finite element space and insert it into the equations of the numerical method. Of course, this project exact solution doesn't satisfy the method equations exactly, but there is a defect, and this is the consistency error, which has to be studied. And then there's the stability issue, which amounts to bounding the errors between the discrete surface and the exact surface in terms of these defects. And the hard part is the stability proof. And this works with this matrix vector formulation that I give you, have, I have shown to you. And the surprising thing is this doesn't use any geometrical arguments. So the stability, geometry somehow doesn't enter the stability proof, but the geometry enters the consistency estimates. And this is consistency uh, bounds there based on early work going back to uh, Juke essentially. And then if you combine consistency and stability, you get this convergence of optimal order. Let me close my talk with a numerical experiment, namely this dumbbell example that we had in the beginning. So here are just the, it's just the initial surface, a dumbbell like here, which will uh, develop such a pinch singularity. And on the left-hand column, I show you Druk's algorithm. The central column is the algorithm that I proposed to you. But the algorithm as I described it to you doesn't take account of the fact that the normal vector has to have length one, which should be a normalized the unit normal vector. And so we normalize the uh, discrete normal vector, which is obtained from these evolution equations in the pictures that you see on the right hand side. And in the first part, as long as the solution is smooth, the methods behave quite similarly, maybe up to a certain time here where you see some wiggles going on in Juke's algorithm. And then quite close to the pinch singularity, Juke's algorithm becomes unstable here. Now here something strange has happened and this strange picture comes about because here the algorithm has been too fast. It has already passed through the pinch singularity and has gone beyond it. Whereas with this normalized, uh, with this version with the normalized uh, unit norm, normal vector, it behaves quite well here. And actually, if I take this normalized algorithm with this, I can get very close to the singularity. But there's no theoretical explanation to this yet. But the algorithm has a remarkable robustness close to the singularity. So I'm now at the end of my talk. Let me just summarize what I wanted to tell you about. We have, I've shown you about how we approximate mean curvature flow by evolving finite elements, where we discretize the velocity law simply by finite element interpolation onto the finite element space. And the key thing is to use parabolic evolution equations for auxiliary geometric quantities, which in our case were the normal vector and mean curvature flow. With this approach, we're able to show optimal order error bounds in the H1 server left norm, not only for the position, but also for the velocity for the normal vector and mean curvature, as long as the exact surface stays smooth. And this approach not only applies to pure mean curvature flow, but applies to all the examples of geometric evolution equations that I showed you in the beginning, 
and to many, and actually we believe to many more. So this approach by evolution equation for geometric quantities is quite flexible approach, which allows to handle in a mathematically rigorous way numerical approximations to geometric evolution equations. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we have to stop <laughs> virtually. And uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me just uh, open to questions and, uh, um, and discussion. Uh, people that are uh, following the seminar on uh, uh, YouTube can uh, use the, um, the chat and, uh, and writing questions on the chat. There is a small delay, but uh, we can, uh, uh, we can see uh, the chat. So um, in, the, in the meanwhile, let me just, uh, uh, let me just start with uh, I have plenty of questions because uh, I think this is, uh, this is a real breakthrough, right? It's, uh, it's something that uh, can uh, really ground on, uh, you know, solid mathematical uh, uh, arguments, uh, the, the, these uh, <clears throat> kinds of uh, um, applications. And, uh, um, uh, well, first of all, uh, the, 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 the results that you showed at the, at the very end, uh, the numerical results have been obtained with uh, uh, um, linear finite elements or quadratic finite elements? They were called co quadratic finite elements, mm -hmm. correspond to the theory, but we observed that numerically, uh, essentially the same behavior you will observe also with uh, linear finite elements, but we have no theoretical explanation for this at the moment. Okay, but, but the method uh, uh, works uh, in, in this case as well. I mean, it's not, uh, it's just a technical, uh, a technical difficulty that has to be. Uh, yeah, but, but it's, a ver it's a very hard uh, technical difficulty. <laughs> but it, the, the, me the method seems, seems to work uh, nonetheless. It's the same with, or even more with Juke's method. Uh, I mean, this has been proved now by Buyang Li uh, to converge for. Uh, Finite element of order six, and uh, in a real, really hard proof. Uh, but it's uh, Juke's method has been used uh, for thirty years now with linear finite elements, and generally, generally it works well, except near these singularities. Okay, and uh, another another question concerns uh, the um, the. The fact that you are you are using uh, uh, C C zero finite elements, right? Yes. Uh, now, uh, I mean, there is a community that uh, has developed uh, these uh, IGA or, or isogeometric uh, uh, methods, which uh, allow to have um, um, C C C K elements, uh, so uh, uh, smooth uh, smoother uh, uh, smoother. Um, uh, representations. So does it uh, th th would it help to to have uh, an approximation with um, with the higher smoothness uh, in 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 maybe in more uh, more intricate uh, intricate uh, geometrical situations? Uh, do you think of help in the in the in in the theory in the, or in help the in, in the quality of the in the quality, I think that I mean, uh, they they have developed a, a technology that uh, can uh, can be applied in in different, uh, par in particular yeah. for for parabolic equations. But uh, it, so, it's... I agree that this is a very interesting approach, and uh, it would be interesting, uh, I think, very interesting to prove convergent results uh, also also for uh, for such methods. I'm not aware of any. Convergent results for such methods yet, but uh, I think if you discretize uh, the set of equations that we did with those uh, C one or even C high, uh, higher uh, regularity methods, it should be possible uh, to uh, to obtain convergence results for them. Uh, but I do not think that, or I would be skeptical that it really helps mm -hmm. over the C C zero. Uh, being C0 is, is not the problem here. 
of uh, you see we obtain even using c0 elements we obtain optimal order error estimates to the mean curvature but the mean curvature approximation that we compute is not the mean curvature of the discrete surface yeah yeah whereas i think the advantage that you uh, would obtain with these higher regularity finite elements is that you could get a uh, higher uh, get approximations to the this uh, to say mean curvature or other curvature quantities also directly from the discrete surface which which we cannot do we only get these approximations from the evolution equations okay let me just ask but i think it's a i think it's a very interesting class of methods that you yeah. addressed yeah i know it was just <laughs> uh, let me just ask if uh, uh, there are other questions in the uh, yes i have a can i ask a question marco please yeah uh, i was wondering if adding the reactive part on the surface would add uh, any additional difficulty I i'm asking that because uh, in many interesting uh, cases, uh, uh, when you have a reaction diffusion equation, the, the kinetic part or the reactive part is stiff. And that usually leads to those patterns you showed us. Uh, yes. Uh, your talk. That's a very good question. So our convergent result doesn't cover stiff uh, reactions. Mm -hmm. I see. Yet, yet. Uh, but uh, this this would be interesting uh, to study. I think that the method is stable also for stiff uh, equations. Uh, we use we use methods that were origin like this PDF time discretization. This was originally devised for stiff problems, and uh, it it should work well uh, here. But uh, we have no convergence result about that, and also no at least I have no numerical experience with stiff reactions in such a uh, geometric evolution context. But it's, it's a very good point, yeah. And maybe another, I mean, maybe it's, it's a very ingenious qu uh, question. I mean, uh, ingenious, uh, in the sense that uh, it would be conceivable uh, to map the surface into a sphere so that uh, uh, you could use some kind of spectral method using uh, uh, maybe com make, make it more complicated the, the equation. And uh, yes, you uh, you could try to do this. So yeah. th this would mean that you actually work with a parameterization, an explicit parameterization of the surface. Okay. Whereas I think the advantage here is that you just are given your initial surface mm -hmm. by a triangulation by, by the nodes of a triangulation, and then everything de develops from that. You never need to deal with an explicit parameterization. Uh -huh. right. I think that that's the big practical adva advantage. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I I don't see any uh, any other questions. So I think uh, we can uh, uh, we can thank. Uh, may may I make a com May I make a comment because this is a, a talk uh, was meant to be a talk for a broad uh, range yes. of mathematicians, yes. not only numerical analysts. What this talk also shows is what have we done? We have taken evolution equations that Huskin devised in 1984 and which have been used for in analysis ever since, but which entered numerical analysis only say three years ago in our, in our work. And this clearly shows a lack of communication. I mean, what we have done now could in principle have been done 20 years ago. Had there been a communication there. And this, com this even goes further. Huskin is a colleague of mine in Tübingen. He's <laughs> in the sixth floor, I'm in the third floor. But this was only via uh, a large detour that they recognized if we, after we had these evolution equations, it took us a while to recognize that these were actually Huskin's evolution equations. So even within the same building, there was a lack of communication. Had I talked to, or had I had the idea of using this, uh, these evolution equations for mean curvature flow earlier, I had talked 
to uh, Husken uh, much earlier. Now, in the end, our paper that we published has a dedication both to Druk on his 70th birthday and to Husken on his 60th birthday. But it really took a long detour uh, from the third to the sixth floor. So <laughs> what this shows is it makes a lot of sense that mathematicians from different areas talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, there is a problem of communications also within uh, within the same community, right? Uh, that uh, sometimes that, one uh, one re rediscovers uh, formulas or results that uh, that we are already on the market. But uh, in particular, what you're saying is um, is is uh, very uh, coherent uh, with uh, with the purpose of of, of the institute uh, which uh, hosts now, because uh, one of the one of the targets is uh, uh, in, within the Italian community to have uh, more uh, dialogue and more uh, interchanges. And uh, I think that the spirit of this uh, uh, giornata is uh, precisely this one, to allow people listen to, uh, you know, to, to, to contaminate themselves, eh? to, to uh, let's say, uh, melt experiences from different, uh, uh, from different know-hows. And you did it perfectly because I think your, uh, your presentation was, uh, was extremely clear and convincing. So let me thank you again and um, uh, let me thank uh, all the participants for uh, attending this uh, presentation. And uh, Christian, I wish you all the best for your, the continuation of your stay in, uh, in Italy. I, I hope that uh, you, you, you you pass the singularity, and now you will go to smooth, <laughs> to smooth surfaces. <laughs> Thank you. I'm optimistic about that, but nevertheless, let me say I really miss uh, uh, meeting uh, yeah. you and uh, other yeah. colleagues. Uh, oh in, yes, in we, we all too. Okay, we too. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, um, we stop here, and uh, we resume at uh, uh, three uh, thirty p.m. Okay, uh, bye bye everybody.